13 mitigator Ford Fusion. I'd like to thank you for listening to Let's Talk Racing.tv. Speedway, thanks for listening to Let's Talk Racing. I'm Teddy Peter, driver of number 17 Toyota in our NASCAR Camp World Truck Series, and you're listening to Let's Talk Racing. <laughs>
Yeah, you know, these, these, these things, even now, I think over a long career, you'll probably win as many as you lose by that kind of deal. Yeah. Now, how do you think the young kid, uh, Elliot there, is doing so far as the, the PR side of it? Well, it's funny. Bill came in the media center on Saturday and, and brought Chase with him, and they had a little dog and pony show press conference there, and Bill said something that nobody in the media center found the least bit surprising when he said, when I came up and started racing, I didn't care about sponsors, I didn't care about publicity, I didn't care about fame, I didn't care about the media, I just wanted to get in that car and race. And all of us who watched him race throughout his career thought, or said to ourselves, well, hell, that's not news, we knew that all along. Mm -hmm. But Bill has never liked the spotlight, Bill has never liked being in front of the public like that. He just wanted to, I mean, he, he was happiest at a racetrack when he could get in that car and put up that window net and nobody could get to him. And that, that may have worked in the 70s and 80s and 90s, but it doesn't work now. And I think Bill has told Chase and brought him up to, to understand that sponsorship obligations and the media and PR and signing autographs and doing all that stuff, that's all a big part of it now. And you can't ignore those people that buy those tickets and write those stories about you. And so I think Chase has been brought up knowing that it's got to be done differently than how his old man did it. <laughs> and so far, he's, he's doing it pretty well. He's answering questions and, and doing everything right. Whereas for years, Bill just, he, he didn't care. He didn't give a rat's ass about anything except driving that car. Hmm. And, and that's, I, I don't know that when Harry Melling sponsored him at first, uh, I don't know that Harry <coughs> might have had to give him a few lectures about behaving and, and acknowledging your sponsor and being nice to your fans. So Chase is already light years ahead of Bill in that regard. Yeah, I would say so, and he's such a well-rounded young man. Well, he seems to be. I mean, he's not the most, his is not the most vibrant personality in the world, but but he still seems to know, and nothing, nothing seems to rattle him, nothing on the yeah. racetrack seems to bother him. Um, he made some moves, I told somebody at lunch that he made a move or two last Friday night that people said, well, you just can't do that here. You know, passing on the outside and, you know, getting them coming off the corner, passing people off the corner on the, on the outside, like when he went around Harvard. So, um, or Bush, whoever he passed, I don't remember. Mm -hmm. uh, yet he's won two in a row, and he won them both the same way, so it kind of runs together. Yeah. He, he's, he's pretty good. And how long do you think they'll, it'll be before they try to put him in a cup car? <sighs> well, I got a feeling... If I was Casey Kane, I'd be a little bit worried. <laughs> yeah, he has a dog. If I were Casey, I'd be thinking, okay, we know Jimmy's not going anywhere. Junior's not going anywhere. Jeff might have two more years after this one. Jeff might retire in 16. But I don't think, in, in, in Casey might say, I don't think they're going to keep Chase down in the, in the nationwide for two more years. Um... Although they may run him in Nationwide next year. Yeah, I, I would have to agree. I would think they would run him one more year, but probably next year run him in four or five, six, eight. And they bring races. him up in 16 to replace Gordon. I, I don't think they'd replace him in, I don't think they'd put him in a car numbered 24. I think they'd like to keep him in number nine. Yeah. Which was his daddy's number. <clears throat> and I suspect that Rick Hendrick will go to Richard Petty and say, can I buy number nine from you? Because the, the Australian guy has no real... Shift to number nine. So let, let me let me buy number nine from you and put Chase in it, and you know give Ambrose another number or something like that. So I think maybe by sixteen we'll see him in a cup car. Yeah, yeah, and, and I kind of agree with you. He kind of has that dry sense of humor, kind of like Bill does. Well, but, I mean Chase already has has made far more friends in the media center and the press box than Bill ever did. I mean mm -hmm. ever. Huh. I mean, I mean, I, he, there are horror stories, and I've got some of them. Is that right? Horror stories of, of reporters finally getting 
be able to talk to them or give them an interview or saying, okay, come to the holler after qualifying and I'll give you 10 minutes. And then when you get there, he, he's sitting up, up in his office in the holler watching cartoons or Three Studios or Roadrunner stuff and he'll just give you yes and no answers and he say, you know, how you doing, Bill? Well, all right, well, how's the car? Fine. Well, what do you think is going to be the key to the race tomorrow? Uh, you got to go fast. I mean, just stuff like that. You can find a lot of media people to this day just don't like him because he was so hard to deal with. And I think Chase is, is way ahead of him in that regard. So, you know, if his personality is, is even a half a point better than Bill's, he'll be fine. So far as sense of humor, uh, the only line I heard the other night that was even remotely really kind of clever was somebody said that, that you missed your high school prom. And he said, well, I had a date with a lady in black. Well, that's pretty good. That's, yeah, that is pretty good. Bill, Bill would have never thought about that. But I don't think his prom was last Friday night. I think it's like coming up. But it just gave him a chance to make that cute little line. So mm -hmm. uh, Dale Jr. came in and talked about it on Saturday. And Dale had a very profound line. He said, you know, I was hoping that JR Motorsports could keep him for a while. <laughs> he's, he's already ahead of schedule. And I don't know how long we're going to have him. Yeah, that's I, I can't up. see I can't see Rick putting him in a car next year. Mm. Well, if he gets two years out of him, I think Junior should be pretty happy with that. Absolutely. Yeah, I got a quick question that's off NASCAR topic for you, Al. All right. You've been hearing about where Stuart Haas is going to have a Formula One team. Well, for when you consider I was in Charlotte all day Monday talking to him for hours. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. I'm vaguely aware of that, Roger. Yes, I'm vaguely aware that. He had a two-hour press conference Monday that ruined my whole day, but <laughs> I was there. Well, I figured I'd throw that at you because you'd be on top there, of it. I talked to him. I think, I mean, I, I like to say I think I know as much about what he's planning to do as anybody, but, but he may have told somebody something he didn't tell me. But anyway, um, I cannot, and it's just me now. What the hell do I know? I can't see it happening next year. I can see him happening in 2016 because he just got his license last Friday or Thursday. I think last I think last Thursday he finally got his Formula One license, and he told us on Monday that I could not. He said I couldn't even begin to talk to people. You can't hire people. You can't rent shop space in Europe. You can't do anything unless you've got the license. He said nobody will even consider talking to you about doing a job until you've got your license. He said, we are just now today beginning to talk to people and hiring people and looking for a place for an old, for a, a shop in Europe. We're building, you know, he's building a shop in Kannapolis across from his stock car team, but that building doesn't even have a roof on it yet. So, you know, and you got to figure the Formula One teams, they start tested in January, so basically he's got about nine months to find somebody to, to partner with and get cars and engines and hire people and, and arrange transportation back and forth from Charlotte to, to Europe. And uh, I, I don't, and, and he didn't sound all that excited, I, I'm sorry, he didn't sound all that certain that he could get it done by, by this year. Well, the end of this year, so I think by 2016 he'll have he'll have everything in place. Yeah. Well, the scuttlebutt was he was going to try to field two cars by 2015. So. It's got to be two cars. Formula One, every team has two cars. Uh, there, are only, there are only 12 teams, and each team brings two cars. So it's a 24 car grid, and everybody makes every race. Um, a few minor exceptions, maybe, but everybody makes every race. Yeah. Um, Somebody asked him what it was going to cost, and he said, oh, it'll cost billions and billions. And he said, each week it seems to go up by another billion. <laughs> and and he, wasn't, he wasn't grinning or laughing. I grinning a little bit, but he, he seemed almost serious about that. Yeah. Um, he's got a five-year commitment, a six-year commitment, and most teams 
most Formula One team budgets are about two hundred million to two hundred twenty million a year. Yeah. Um, so yeah. give him five years. Yeah, the ship is first normal. million right there. Yeah, but he can afford it. He's got the money. Yeah. I mean, does he have that kind of money though? I mean, I guess he is a, a big, he is a billionaire. But I mean, if you spend a billion, you ain't you ain't got much left. Well, but I mean, Formula One, if you, they they get paid at the end of the year based on points. They don't get paid per race. They're they're basically racing for points each weekend. They're not racing for anything. I mean, you won't see a, a, a money sheet. You won't see a payoff sheet. They're, those guys don't stand in line at the at the anyone <laughs> each each weekend. Um, and what what Gene Haas thinks will happen, Roger, is. Yeah, you know, right now he's pretty much got the American market cornered on machine tools. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And he wants to be the worldwide leader in that in that business. And he said, I'm already doing some business in Europe. I'm already doing business in the Middle East and the Far East. I'm doing some business in Australia. I'm doing some business in, in South America. But he said, Formula One will allow me to become the world's biggest, most successful, he didn't say most profitable, he means that, machine, tool machine guy in the world. Yeah. And, and he thinks that eventually it will come back and pay him back what his investment is. I got you. So you think this is more of a business strategy? Oh, exactly. And like you. he said, he said, I like the idea of Formula One only because it's worldwide. He said, I like the idea that there's a world championship, not just an American championship. And he said, frankly, when I go to Europe, when I go to the Middle East and the Far East and Australia, hardly anybody has ever heard of NASCAR to any great extent. Hmm. He so said, Formula One is, he said, y'all can talk about NASCAR all you want, but Formula One is the world's most uh, watched, the most closely covered motor racing series in the world. Huh. Now, not in the United States, and maybe not in the Western Hemisphere, but, but where most of the people are in the world, it's the biggest thing going. Formula One in soccer, the biggest, <laughs> me, the biggest thing going. Cool. Well, let me go ahead and let you go, Al. And uh, we'll continue on with our next group of people we got coming on here. Right, who, who you got on tonight, anyway? Oh, uh, let's see. I've got uh, Andrew, Andrew Grady, Lynn O'Neill, and Randy LaJoy. Well, his first name was who now? Andrew Grady. He's a late model driver. Lynn O'Neill, he does the arena and late model here in South. I know, Randy. Well, where's the Grady guy from? Do you know? I think he races at. Uh, Where are you from, Andrew? I might go North Carolina. Oh, Nightdale, okay. He's not, he's not any of Taylor Grady and Ruben Grady's people that used to be out in Midlothian. Okay, Roger, right, have a nice show. All right, Al. I'll try to come see you next Wednesday night. All right, All right. sounds good. Thanks, Al. Let's see if I still remember how to do that. All right, still there, Andrew? Yes, sir. All right. How you doing tonight? we got Andrew Grady on the line now. Well, I'm pretty good enjoying this crazy old Carolina weather. <laughs> North Carolina, I think it's hitting everywhere, isn't it? Oh, yes, sir. Yesterday it was 82 degrees. I walked out to my house this morning to go to school, and it's 29. I'm freezing. got the heat on, and then after then it's 82 degrees and ice. It's crazy. Yeah, I tell you, some of the people, uh, I remember on Facebook, some of our friends, they were sitting there saying, yesterday I was in shorts, and today I'm wearing snow snow stuff on because there's snow outside. Yes, sir. It's, uh, it's just crazy. I don't know what's going on with this weather, but... Perfect, perfect, perfect weather for my ears and light models. <laughs> You're right. Global warming, that's what it is. Yes, sir. Oh, we can always blame it on the J Japanese earthquake, too. That's, that's a very good point. Japanese always have something to do with American weather. I'm well, always if, that. if you remember, they did say, I think it shifted the uh, Earth's axis by about eight tenths of a degree. I did hear that somewhere. That's, uh, that's over my head, Roger. <laughs> yeah. That's well, I mean. <laughs> Over your head is usually when you're upside right. down in your arena car. If it's any more than loose or tight, I'm not sure. Okay. <laughs> Did you ever get that truck fixed? <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. We're rolling now. Anywho, give us a little bio about yourself there, Andrew. 
Um, I'm 20 years old. I race late model stock cars at uh, Southern National Speedway, which is in Kenley. I race at Wake County Speedway, which is my home track, which is located in Raleigh. Um, I've been in racing for two years. My dad told me he's raced for the better part of 25. He's raced the year round race, super late models. He's a two-time AMA Supercross, a flat track champion. Um, let's see, I've always wanted to go into racing since I was little, and finally I paid my dad enough when I was 15 to buy me a late model, and it took off from there. <laughs> so he bought you a late model right out of the gate? Yes, sir. He said, if we, he told me, <laughs> we're going to race something, we're going to race something with some power. We ain't going to run no you cars, we're going to race something with some power. So Dang. Hey, that, that's pretty good. So you're 20 years old, and you, you're, what, so you're in college now, or? Yes, sir, I'm in college. I'm, I'm a full-time law student. A law student? Yes, sir. Oh, God, yeah. crash him. He's going to take you to court. I know. <laughs> <laughs> <coughs> what, uh, what, what do you, what do you, do you have a, uh, a schedule for yourself as to what you're going to do as you get going in the racing world? Well, my dad really has a five-year plan so far that he's gone out with um, with Jim Dean, Jim Dean Motorsports, and we're affiliated with him. He's helping us out a little bit this year. The plan is um, we're going to run a full-time schedule this year, um, two tracks mainly, Lake County and Southern National with the late models, so we're going to try to compete for track championships at both. Then um, next year we're going to start really start getting really, really heavy into late model racing. Maybe if the UA already starts back up, we'll go do that, or maybe a couple pass races. And then hopefully we want to be in better classes such as um, modifies and maybe a truck right here. There, that, that'd be really awesome. Now, you you driving for uh, uh, your dad's team, or is this uh, another team you're driving for? Um, I'm driving for my dad, um, but uh, Jim Dean does help us out um, with like um, knowledge, pull down the hips, stuff like that. Well, that's pretty good guy to have on your side. Oh yes, sir. He is. He's a. Uh, he's, he's a real big help. Um, huge, huge. His knowledge is just overwhelming. He talks to me, and I'm just like, oh. Huh? Yeah, right. <laughs> no idea what you just said. Yeah. So what what car number do you have? Are you running your dad's number? Yes, sir. Uh, number one, because there's only one number one. <laughs> There you go. <laughs> That's a good one. Yeah, Lynn, the next guest, he races number one also. Yeah, yeah. If I do, well, I'm the only number one that matters. There, there you, you go, go. There you go. I bet he has something to say about that, too. You know <laughs> well, that's a big guy. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm pretty sure I can outrun him. <laughs> Probably. <laughs> yeah, he, he's not that fast. He ain't that fast. Yeah, exactly. In, in y'all's five year plan, have y'all started talking to any of the. Uh, Upper race teams. Uh, um, he's kind of, we've we talked to a couple of people, but um, I'm not ready yet to really move up. Um, you know, if, if somebody was off me a ride, I'd take it. But right now, we're really um, I'm really just getting acclimated with cars and everything. You know, Towns and Oliver gave me a great race car this year. Um, Mike Garner and Dennis Rock, my crew chief and my car chief, they give me a great, great race cars. We won three out of four races this year. Um, hopefully, in the next six to eight months, I'll be able to. Dabbling or something a little bit faster, like a super late model. But um, right now, we're really focusing on our short track program. Cool. So, how do you like Southern National Speedway? Oh, I love it. I love it. I love the high banks. You can run the high line, you can run in the middle, you can run anywhere. I really, really like the high line there. That's a really, really fast, that's a really, really fast place, and I love it. It's really, um, it, it's really a driver's track, you know, you can really have a good car, but you have to hustle a race car around there to really be in contention for a win. Yeah, well, we went there for, for the very first late model race there. <clears throat> they, put on, they put on one heck of a show there. Yeah, and the new guys that got it this year seem to be doing really well, with, or last year, I think you bought it last year, and it still seemed to be doing really well out there. It's yeah. a nice place. I mean, it's really, they built it well, very nice in the beginning, they, you know, they've added some stuff, in this, but it is a nice place. Yeah, it really is. The, it's, the, the people that run it, you know, such as like the officials and like, you know, they're really, really nice people and they really care about the races. And that's, mm -hmm. and, that's, and that's what I really like. I really like to be able to go into a racetrack and, you know, everybody's really friendly. Yeah. You know, if something breaks, they'll come help you, anything like that. That's, that's what I really like about that place. Now, do you participate in, in the, uh, the Thanksgiving race they have? Um, I ran the um, limited race last year. Um, we we fared pretty good. Um, we actually uh, we actually started dropping the cylinder towards the end of the race, and we still, we still wound up fifth. Um, my dad ran last year, but um, he blew a motor, and so that kept him out of running. Mike um, Mike Dawn, the guy that helps me, he um, he finished eighth, I believe, and he started like twenty fifth or something. So we're gonna um, I'm pretty sure I'm gonna run the late model race this year for the Thanksgiving Classic. 
Yeah, yeah. A guy that I usually spot for at Langley Speedway went out there to run, and uh, I didn't go with him, but uh, he got a few laps in. He had just put a new engine in the car, and engine popped while he was out there running about five or ten laps in. Really? <laughs> so is, is your dad still driving today? Oh, he actually has a brand thousand dollar car sitting in Charlotte. He's, he's going to run a little bit this year, but I'm not really sure what his schedule is since our programs really started clicking now this year. Um, I'm trying to talk to him to run in Martinsville one more time. I mean, <laughs> that's, that's, that's the one place I want him to win at. I mean, he's got over 200 degrees, but that's the one place that I want him to run good at. We've been fast there a lot, but we've always gotten run over or something crazy happened in the heat race when we're in the transfer spot. Yeah, I, that, that's, a, that's a tough race there to get in i mean you you get tore up just like you said over somebody else's stuff or, or you, yeah. you know somebody's knocking somebody away in a transfer spot and then and you get caught up in it you can you can use a car up there pretty easy exactly well i really think nascar should do something different about it i mean you know it, it's it's i love i love that they let us race there but at the same time mm -hmm. i hate it because they let so much stuff go on that doesn't need to happen they let people just blatantly turn each other for no reason when they're in a transfer spot. And I did, yeah, we're going to put on a show for the fans, and it's awesome, but when you're tearing up good, personally good race horse for no reason just to put on a show for the fans, I'm really not okay with that. We can beat and bang that spot that's racing. Right. Just don't, don't turn me in the fence at 140 and clip my race car and junk it. I got to take it home in a box. Yeah, yeah. I think somebody did that last year, if I ain't mistaken, I can't remember who it was, but... Yeah, there was a couple of them that really, that their race cars were really hard. Um, Anderson Bowen and um, Michael McGuire's cars were really hard after that bad wreck in three and four. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I totally agree with you. I mean, I guess you could just say, hey, if you qualify and you make it, you make it. If you don't, you don't. Um, but Exactly right, but yeah. it's in that car, so we can't, you really can't fight with Big Brother too much on that one. Yeah. They're still letting us play in their sandbox. <laughs> so, yeah, you got to play in their sandbox, you got to follow their rules. Exactly right. But anywho, so uh, who's uh, your, uh, not really a mentor, but somebody that you look up to in racing? Um, Other than my dad, um, hmm. well, that's a tough one. Um, my top three would probably be uh, Randy Renfro, um, mm -hmm. he that man. That's a tough one. Um, Randy Renfro, uh, Mike Darn, and probably Lee Cool. So how come you That's want you started so late into racing? Is that something yeah. you just were in helping your dad yeah, race, and then you just decided that you wanted yeah. to do it yourself? Pretty much, I was a little um, I I started for my dad a, a lot since I was thirteen. But I was really, I really think that um, to be a good race car driver, you not only have to know how to drive a car, but you also have to know how to set one up, have to work sure. on it. And and that's what I really focused on towards the beginning of my younger years. And then I found it, hey, that look, I want to race, let's go buy a car. And he bought me a car and started racing. Yeah, I, I would totally, totally agree. I think uh, learning how to learn, work on a race car is, is huge to be a driver, I think. It knows what it takes to fix it if you tear it up. Exactly right, and I really don't like tearing up race cars. <laughs> well, speaking of tearing up race cars, now I'm going to ask you one of those type of questions we throw out there. What's been your most embarrassing racing moment? Ah, uh, my, my most embarrassing racing moment. Um, my, it was probably my second or third race at Wake County. I had never ever driven anything with a clutch, and I could not get <laughs> on the first straight away to start stuffing in our tires for the race. <laughs> my feet, I fall out. I moved my feet, I fall out. And then finally they got the record and I, he started pushing me and not in the second and I hop on the wall. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's pretty embarrassing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I bet your dad was like, what am I getting myself into? But well, we won't tell anybody, okay? Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's okay. I laughed at it to the same so did my dad because we, yeah. we came a long way from there. Yeah. Yeah, I would say, would you say you won four out of the first five races? Um, I've won three out of the last four. The first race of the season, um, at Southern National, we, uh, we qualified second, but, um, my, my, my race was a little bit too high, and they disqualified us. They just went last. It was a, um, 60 lap race. On lap 20, I was up to fifth, battling, and a guy ran me on the apron and came down when we cut the right front tire, and I drove the next 10 laps with the flame water and dragging the ground. Mm -hmm. Well, let's go ahead and, uh, let you go ahead and do a shout out to your sponsors, and we'll let you get back to doing what you were doing. 
Alright, uh, shout out to ABC Motor Degree, Mike Darn Racing, um, Dennis Brock, Dean Motorsports, Jim Dean, um, Calvin Oliver Race Cars, uh, KT Engine Development, um, all my guys that are listening, all my fans, my, my family, everybody, thanks for all your support, and um, I really appreciate you having me on the show tonight, guys. Alright, good luck, Andrew. We'll talk to you next time. Alright, bye. How you doing tonight, Lynn? We got Lynn O'Neill on the line with us. I'm doing good. Yeah, myself and Scott Allen are here with us. Oh, my, my buddy Scott. <laughs> <laughs> What's yeah, up, Lynn? You haven't even had, had any bad runs with Lynn, have you? A couple times, yeah. Oh, God. But me and Lynn's good. Okay. <laughs> Just as long as yeah, he's better than him. He was pretty bad at me for a little while there last year. <laughs> Well, that's all good. Yeah, so we got, we were touching our song, I was going like, yeah, go on, I'm going to wreck you, I'm not going to wreck you. Scott Perlman needs to know that, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Nah, Lynn's okay. I'll tell you, you don't want to get Lynn mad at you, though, I'll tell you that. Yeah, I, I, I'm old school, I, I kind of I <laughs> get back, like, bad with what I get you. That's all good, man. You're pretty. It's entertaining now. I would say, Lynn, give me a good break. This past weekend, uh, we 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 were we're doing okay. We went to the back, and Lynn let me go by, and and I went by and thank you for that. Now, are you still racing late models too, Lynn? Oh yeah, we we uh we ran Lake County uh I guess week four last, and uh I followed the guy who was just on the show. <laughs> so, oh really? <laughs> oh, is that right? Oh, that is that's so funny. Should have chimed in or said something. Yeah, he, yeah, I he's a, he's a good little driver. I mean, he's, he's you know, got good equipment and good driver, so I mean, that's pretty awesome. Well, you know, follow them. So, are you still the number one? Because he said he's running number one. Yeah, we had three number ones then, I believe it or not. We, and, uh, and all three of us were in the top six in the second race. So. Dang. You know, he just started driving late model. I mean, his dad took him, he was, I think, 16, so just like two or three years ago, he told his dad he wanted to start driving, so he just bought him a late model, and they went late model run. Yeah, well, yeah. I, I guess I've been fortunate. I raced against his dad and him, so mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, I'm the middle guy on this deal. <laughs> <coughs> so, what's your what's your schedule this year? What are you going to be running? Um, we're going to run Lake County every race, um, and then we're going to run. We're actually running the Denny Hamlin race it's coming. I guess it's coming a week. Yeah. Um, we got that going, and then we're going to run the Hampton Heat probably, and and uh, we have uh, Junior National Guard. Came on board pretty decent. So oh, really? Going and, oh, good for you. So, yeah, and Heritage Chevrolet been back in 19. Uh, I'm from my age now, 1994. Mm -hmm. So, they've been having me since I went late while stock racing. I think I, I just got out of high school, then. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so was I. No, I was You're going to try to make you feel old or something? Is that what you're trying to hey, do? Hey, when you're down in the garage, we give each other a hard time. Yeah, it's, it's amazing how, how I don't feel like I've been around that long, you know what I mean? I, yeah. I started racing when I was 22 and in stock calling. I mean, I kind of, I'm now 46, so I guess I've been around a while. Yeah, a little while. So how did you get into racing, Lynn? Well, I grew up right in Natrick, Virginia, right around the corner from Lenny Pond. And uh, and I when I was, I think I was like four or five years old, uh, probably five years old, I was sneaking out to the bedroom window going over to his shop. <laughs> Get up and I was gone, and you know, this when times different, you know, we never locked doors, nothing like that in the little village we lived in. Right. Uh, and I, they'd call over there, and Lenny said, Yeah, he's over here with me. And so I, you know, I hung with Lenny for all the years, and, and uh, you know, went up from a kid on up. His son, we all went to school together, and, and uh, so I, I got him to blame for me getting in this race. Now. now, did he run the number one? It, where did the number one come from? Yeah, actually, he, he uh, he ran the, the original one VA, and uh, when I started racing, I, I, I asked him, I said, you know, because, you know, I wanted to run the colors and all, and he, he said, go ahead. And, and then when he quit racing cup and he actually came back to lay my stock racing at Southside, I went to, you know, I went to him, I said, look, I said, you want your number back? He looked at me, he said, you had a longer night at it. I said, I didn't know that was going to be it. You know, you know I'm like, yeah, he went cup, and I'm still here. That's that's pretty cool though. So that so that's really how your paint scheme and all that stuff come from. Yeah, it, when I was, I guess the nineteen seventy two is the first I can remember. I've been going to Southwest Billy since, since nineteen sixty eight, and uh, when I 
I was 18 years old, and, I, and I can, the first year I can really remember is 1972, and I can remember Lenny running the yelling goal one PA car with just Sonny Hutchins and them two wrecking each other every lap. Okay. And that kind of stuff. And, and uh, so I kind of, you know, that, that car ruined me for life and, and, and the rest of history, I guess. Yeah. You got a lot of money invested in that number one VA, right? Well, I mean, really, we're low buck, we're low buck weight model guys. So, mm -hmm. You know, we, we don't have, you know, we, and the car I got the 1996 stock car product car, you know, back to chassis. Mm -hmm. um, and I just finally got a Hitchcock car. Uh, so I only had, I only had day races on it. And I'm trying to get that together. I was hoping to have it ready for the Denny race, but it's not going to happen. Um, so we'll probably hopefully have that for the Hampton Heat. But, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm behind the eight ball on some of the equipment, but, you know, the, the, the desire's there and the guys work hard. And, I mean, we've been able to, like, we went to Wake and we started 21st and finished 10th in the first 30 lap. And in the second 30 lap, we started 10th and then got up to fourth and I messed up on a clean restart. Mm. Uh, that put me back to seventh and we came back to, we were underneath the guy from fifth on the last lap. So, yeah, you, know, you can, you can, sometimes you can make the old stuff work. Yeah, yeah. I mean, hey. I mean, I know you guys are, are, are 110 percent behind you for sure. Oh, yeah. One of my favorite shows to be is Top Racing. I don't pay a in a bit or nothing like that. So I mean, I've been very, very fortunate with the guys coming to help me like they do. You know, in today's time, you know, usually people got a little bit of money, and and I rent cars to people who got money. You know what I mean? So I, I see how the money can work too, and it's just you know, one of them deals where I don't have it, so I just do yeah, I mean we're we're just, we're the same way in the arena. I tell everybody we're not a low budget team, we're a no budget team. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, I'm, I've been fortunate not to be the very bottom of the low budget, but I'm yeah, you know, I'm not the you know the big budget guy either. And I, and it's probably got me in trouble sometimes at racetracks because I'll stand up for the little guy more than you know, and I, you know, I'll, and I'm kind of vocal when it comes to you know that people want to spend a lot of money to race. Yeah, you know, like South Side Speedway. I mean, I, you know, I'm banned from there for life because I stood up to the lady because she cut our purse in half and never called us to tell us. You know, we, we, the house thing I'm getting a check for 700 bucks, I get 350. Right, and just somebody like you, that's a lot. Right, and I mean, I, I spent $560 in tires at night and, you know, fit fast for me and, you know, whatever I messed up I had to pay for, you know, by the time you figure it all up, it's a $1,000 night. You know what I mean? And, and mm -hmm. I'm thinking I'm going to hold 300 instead I'm going to hold, you know, 700, you know? So it's kind of hard, you know? You, you know, you don't survive like that if you're a little black guy. You got to, you know, you got to look at what you're doing and, you know, and make sure you have enough to, to clean race when it's sponsorship to make it happen. And I take the gamble that I'm going to be a top full car over there. And then, you know, when I finish third, next thing you know, I'm in the hole like that. And she didn't, she didn't understand that, I guess. She's not a racer, so she don't understand it. Yeah, and, and I will say that about you. You you are uh, you will stand up and, and voice your opinion, which is, you know is a good thing. It just means you're passionate. <clears throat> now, but talking about Southside, what do you think some of the things they need to do over there? I mean, I, honestly, I, I think sometimes they just need to revamp the whole thing and, and kind of start over. Need a new owner. Well, I mean, well that's included. I mean, I just think the whole thing needs to. I mean, the, the track is fine. I mean, I love the place, uh, and I hope. He's with or without me being there. I hope it's there for another hundred years. You know what I mean? Yeah. I always, I always thought my kids would go there and enjoy it. You know what I mean? I, and it's kept me out of trouble. You know, it got me in some trouble, but it's kept me mostly out of trouble when I was growing up. You know what I mean? So, sure. Yeah, we could have uh, been running the roads. You know, I, I hate to see it being done like it's done. I mean, it, that place should be just as big as Bowman Gray Stadium. I mean, we had some of the best racing around. I'd rather see a ten car race at South Beale than a than a. 30 car race in South Boston. Mm -hmm. you know, it's just it's so tight and it's good racing. And, and it's just a shame that, that you know, a shame that I'm not a part of it, I guess, no more. But, you know, at the same time, she got rid of four of us for what nine people did. You know what I mean? Did you see you're not the only one that was banned? Oh, yeah. Me, me and, uh, and Greg Fernandez. And then the only, two of my crew members that had nothing to do with it. They didn't even say a word about the whole thing. She banned them too. <laughs> so, and you know, the sad part is that there was only three people from Southside that was even invited to the Denny Hamlin race. It was me, Greg Fernandez, and Eddie Johnson. <laughs> so, you know, and, and all three of us aren't even racing that anymore. 
Is Bug still racing? Yeah, I just actually was by his house yesterday morning. And uh, he, he was going to go to his dinner race, but he said his motor is down. He's back with those. Hmm. I tell you, he used to have so much fun. Just hanging around him can be fun. Yeah, he, 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 he's the one of our witch doctors. He, uh, <laughs> he's a legend over here. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you remember that old wise tater chip? Paper Moon or something? No, uh, that won't be. That won't, that was probably Johnny Eversall. <laughs> hey, hang on a second, Randy. Well, somebody, right, I, I know he drove for him. I know Billy Morris drove for that team. Mm, yeah, I, I, I don't know. My but, wife would let me ride, ride something. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, what can we say? All right, Glenn, before we go, we tell us the story. You told me a story about sneaking into Richmond International. You kept sneaking in, and Paul Sawyer kept asking you how you got in. Tell that story. Yeah, I, I was there and uh, we kept speaking in the pits and, and me and my buddies and all. And finally, Paul, my dad was in with Paul Sawyer trying to build a track. And uh, first it was Prince George County, built a new super speedway. It was a mile and the, I think it was a mile and a quarter, a mile and a half that they were trying to build. And then they went to Denwood, where the drag strip is, and they were going to build it there. Well, Paul saw me one time, he, I snuck in the pits. And finally he called me and he said, look, he said, I'm not mad at you. He said, I don't want you to get hurt. He said, just, you tell me how you get in here, I'll give you a fifth pass for the rest of your life. <laughs> like, all right, here's how we're going to, sorry, we, we, when the Goodyear man, you know, they used to back the Goodyear truck up to the step, the whole bottom of the truck was like left wide open, and they, you know, they swing the doors up. Well, we waited for the Goodyear man to take a break, and then we would sneak underneath the trailer and haul butt into the pit, and then we get caught, you know, like 30 minutes later and run us back out. We'd come back in. And finally, he said, he's slow, he said, well, he just, you know, you got a fit pass. And, and every time on the day, Mr. Sorry had me a fit pass, every time. <laughs> <laughs> but it, I had a real cool time, one time with Sonny Hutchins. Oh, God. I must have been five or six years old, and my dad, we were walking around the south side of Pittsburgh, and him and Lenny had got into it all night long. And uh, I was walking out, and my dad goes, my dad had known Sonny and stuff, he goes, he said, son, this is Sonny Hutchins. And Sonny reached out his hand to shake my hand, and, and I pulled my hand back, put it behind my back, took two steps back. I, I looked at him, I said, yeah, he was dead me. I don't want to make stuff, you know. <laughs> I did, he got mad at me and busted me. And, yeah, I still didn't touch his hand, and, you know, and he said, I'm sorry, and he kind of walked off. And my dad busted at me all the way to the car. Well, baby, 10 years later, I, won, I finished second in the good part championship at, uh, Fox Stock at the media car track, and we had our banquet. And they had Sonny Hutchins up there handing at the trophy. <laughs> so they call my name for second place. I go up there and get the trophy. Sonny, 
Somebody has him in his left hand. He goes to hand it to me. He pulls it back. He said, I bet you shake my hand now. <laughs> I said, I go like, yes, sir. You know, <laughs> what do you do? You know, he had, but I thought the man would never forget that. You know, I thought he would never remember it. And the next thing you know, he remembered it. But, you know, it, it, and I, I see it today from being raised so long. And I really admire what Tommy Hutchins did, Tommy Hutchins, and all those guys did. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they, they, you know, but you know, I might not like them at the time, but they, they were awesome race car drivers. Uh, that's a pretty good story. Well, we'll have to meet up with you when you get down here for the heat race at Langley. Well, yeah, come on over and talk to me. All right, we'll go ahead and thank your sponsors, and we're going to go ahead and get our next partner on here, Randy LaJoyce, sitting here listening to you. Yeah, we, uh, I'd like to thank the National, National Guard, Heritage Chevrolet. They've been with me since 1994. Um, uh, Decals Unlimited, uh, Traveling Glow, we've got Glow and Purple sponsors with, um, you know, we're a little bit slack on the sponsorship side this year. We, uh, you know, I, I, I've enjoyed doing the arena race, and I have polo so I'm loaded on that car. Um, that's something that's kind of became my little golf game for us. And, uh, mm-hmm. But it got, got a little serious there here and there. But, it, but I really enjoyed that. So, but, uh, you know, we just have a good time racing. So, thank you for letting me have, be on the show. All, All right, right thanks, we'll talk to you later. I'll see you in a couple weeks. All right, see ya. Bye. Right. How you doing tonight, Randy? I'm doing great, guys. How are you? Yeah, pretty good. I hope you didn't mind listening to the last end of that conversation. Well, he's a very uh, Virginian accent. I can say, was it Ricky Dennis? <laughs> no, no, it wasn't Ricky, but uh, we, we, me and him both run arena cars for Ricky up at, uh, at Richmond International. Or Richmond yeah. Coliseum. Yeah, he used to also race uh, late models, or he still does race late models. Yeah, yeah. You gotta do it. Yeah. yeah. So, so, what, so what's life like now there, Randy? Well, you know, it's, uh, we had a death a couple of weeks ago in Florida with, with a young girl, and, you know, there, there's still people getting hurt out there racing uh, because of their, uh, I guess you could say they're, they're, they're uninformed with mm-hmm. safety systems in cars. Uh, I've been very passionate the last 10 years uh, about safety. Uh, Gone to way too many funerals, and uh, let's see. I think I've already been to eight tracks this year, uh, and uh, I'm continuing. I'm going up to West Cassett, Maine, in two weeks for their opening weekend and spec cars. Uh, one of the racetracks up in Connecticut, uh, the Staff Motor Speedway, Marco Root. Uh, I'm friends with the family forever. My dad raced there. I raced there, and. Uh, I had conversations with Mark about it uh, right after that girl passed away, and, and it tears him up as much as it tears me up. Mm-hmm. And he's putting in place at his racetrack up there in Stafford, which is a fast half mile asphalt track. If you're not contained, you're not racing. And, and you know, it, it just that was that was music to my ears so that somebody has the the onions to do that. Is that right. okay, guys? And gals, if you want to race in my facility, you have to be contained because we know containment is good. Uh, so that's great, and that's uh, I'm going to preach containment for for till the day they put some dirt on me. But uh, mm-hmm. you know, it, it's, I love racing. I love short track racing. I love going and watch short track racing, uh, and it just tears me up when I read papers that people get hurt doing this stuff because. You know, it is dangerous, but the, the information is out there. People want to look at it. And, then, and you know, I'm sure the mom and dad in Florida would have, you know, I mean, a $1,000 bill is a lot of money, but a $1,000 bill would have saved that girl's life. Yeah, but well, that's cheap, honestly. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. It, it's, it, you can't replace the life. So how did how did you get involved in coming up with the seats? Now, were you still driving when you when you started this? Yeah, I started, I started the seat company in 1997. Uh, that was during my second year of my championship. My first year was 96, second was 97. Uh, really got into it in about 2000, 2000. Just kind of, I was building with it, you know, for two, three years. Uh, the, the seat that I used was designed in 1972 by the late Mark Donahue. Okay. My dad, my dad seen him at a trade, uh, at a car show in Hartford, Connecticut. My dad was a racer, and, and he'd seen, wow, that, that seat looks comfortable. And he sat in it, and Mark's like, well, I go 
struggle for myself, but my dad and him were the same size, thankfully, and, and Mark, you know, sold him one, but it was out of his Trans Am car, which had a lot more room. My dad, my dad and Russ modified did, so my dad, because it was a fiberglass seat, so he just, you know, kept cutting it and had one of his buddies in the fiberglass business. Once he got done with it, you know, shorted it all up, it's okay, you know, and he started making them. So when I started driving, I, I used that seat. And golly, that, that's, uh, it was Mark Downey he was way ahead of his time because it's uh, the first shoulder-supported seat that I've ever seen. Mm -hmm. I was coming up, but... Uh, it didn't hold you in by your ribs, which everybody else's did. They, they held you by your ribs instead of your shoulders. Uh, and, you know, during the course of uh, running well, when I started and getting better, they had a lot of car owners call you to drive your cars, uh, which is totally separate from today's day. They call you and see if you got a wallet. <laughs> uh, so I, my talent was good enough that they called me up and wanted me to drive, and they think, hey, you know, we're... We, the last driver, you know, I got a seat in my car, just bring your helmet, and that's what I did. And, you know, black and blue, and my back was sore, and my neck, I just, uh, I was amazed how uncomfortable a, a square seat is compared to mine, which is round. I mean, it, it, uh, one of the things I had to do to make it, uh, NASCAR would not let me use a fiberglass seat anymore in 1994. Uh, even though I had a steel cage around it, because I flipped it pretty hard in Daytona in uh, 1983-84. And uh, they, they, they even from that said, Randy, as long as you're around, you could use that seat. Because nothing happened to it because they had a steel frame around it. Mm -hmm. uh, and at the time, we, nobody cared about weight. I mean, not, not a whole lot, you know, and I was more worried about myself. Uh, so... And nobody ever said, okay, you know, this thing's too heavy, you can't use it. Well, once they outlawed the fiberglass, you know, I brought it to the seat manufacturers that were all down here in Calport area, there's two or three of them, and neither, none of them wanted to do anything for me. And I was like, guys, I've been racing for 10 years, and, you know, this, this seat's a whole lot more comfortable than those square seats that you're trying to sell. Uh, and, you know, one of, one of the guys pissed me off pretty hard. Uh, and I said, okay, well, one of these days I'm going to find somebody that, that can form this aluminum. And one of the reasons nobody wants to do it because you know, a flat piece of aluminum is easier than a round piece of aluminum. Anytime you put shape into something, it, it, it costs you money. Mm -hmm. But, you know, that's something I, you know, thankfully when I did race, I did okay. Uh, being an ass the Bush Series champion, I, you know, I made a, a couple of nickels. Uh, and I invested all into uh, uh, stampings for these seats because it's totally different. I get them stamped out of Ohio, a hundred ton stamp, stamps these things, uh, and then I put them together. I have a patent on my sizing fixture, and I really thought when I started the business everybody would want a comfortable seat. Uh, and then as I was going, uh, yeah, I had all the GM reps, the Ford reps, and like, man, uh, the ASA people, GM was really tiny with ASA, uh, and they said, Randy, we want to test one of your seats. I said, hey, love, love you two. You know, they said, we really like it. Well, they brought the seat back, and it was damaged, and I knew it was going to get damaged, and I damaged it before, and when they showed me the video of the seat that I gave them, which was one of mine, that I had damaged, and it, it, I damaged it worse than it was bent. You know, I just straightened it out and went again. Mm -hmm. When they showed me the video, it, it turned my stomach. I thought I was gonna puke. Dang. And I was like, wow, that, that, that 35 miles an hour? And I bent the seat that far worse. <clears throat> okay, I better make it a lot stronger. Uh, a Ford engineer hooked me up with a company out in California when I was racing out there. I took a ride down to Riverside seeing how they mold stuff, uh, seeing how they add ripples to stuff for strength, uh, come back, talk to my guy that does the stampings, and, and we sat down, we, we had it been odd, we said, how are we gonna make this thing stronger? Uh, we come up with that guardrail design that's on my shoulders, and you know, and then I then I started roll caging my seat. I, I put a round tube around all my seats. I was the first guy to, and, and the competitor that pissed me off, that I was going to kill somebody because the seats was too strong. You know, and that was his take.
make to tell people not to buy my seats because they were too strong. And that's, that's, he still believes that. <laughs> uh, named Brian Butler, uh, he still believes that the, the body has to move. And, you know, I totally disagree because being a crash test dummy that I was, <laughs> I, mean, I felt a lot better when I made my feet stronger and I didn't move. Uh, I've been against the door bars on the left side. I blew a tire in Charlotte going into one a week before I got married. Uh, and I can vividly remember that with a remote face helmet, I thought I was going to eat the shifter handle. Mm. I mean, I could have swore I was going to eat it, and I stopped. I mean, I want to say two inches. And I sat back in that car and said, how can my head get down there? Yeah. And then you look, I mean, I, I do a lot of testing, uh, and it's amazing. It, it don't stretch. Your body is 60% fluid. Uh, so everything's going to move. It's a, like you're trying to contain a bowl of jello. Yeah, I don't think you. I don't think people realize how much we do move around in cars. I, like I said, I, I run one of those arena cars for Ricky Dennis up in uh, the Richmond Coliseum, and, and I got flipped over earlier in the season, and I don't have any shoulder pieces in mine, and and I actually moved over and bent the crush panels on the left side of the seat. I mean, we got a video of it. I mean, the only thing that done it was me. You know, I mean, obviously, I don't know what happened because it happened so fast, but you don't realize how much you get slung around. Well, it's crazy, and you know, like I said, it's, 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 the body is a bowl of jello. You know, mm -hmm. and you try to contain it. The belts are going to stretch. Mm -hmm. They've gotten a lot better in the, in the stretching uh, of the belts. They, they used to be twenty four percent stretch. Uh, I think they got them down to, to eight twelve now with with the new polyester belts instead of uh, nylon. Mm -hmm. uh, but you will move, and you know, going back to you know being too strong. There's no information in the world, uh, Formula One to IndyCar to NASCAR to any division to, to even fighter planes. A lot of information gets crossed over from that industry. That the occupant that did not move got hurt. We don't have any information like that. Every time that somebody gets hurt, it's because they move. Uh, so that's one of the things I, I've been preaching is guys, you know, you want to keep your head. That you want to keep your nose, your chest, and your pelvis all in line. Well, when you're sitting in the car, and if you hit something 90 degrees on your side, you want your nose, your chest, and your pelvis to move together. It's going to move. Mm -hmm. Don't let your head go. Don't let your shoulder go and hold your hips. you got to keep everything in line. Less movement is better. Head and neck restraints. I mean, it's, it's a system in these cars now. Uh, seat belts. Uh, one of the things that, it, that I've been a, a proponent on is when I first tried them was a six-point seat belt. Uh, and what everybody out there has their old five-point system, which is, you know, I, the only thing that does when, when you flip over, it, it holds your belt on your lap. So if you pull your shoulder belts tight, you know, your lap belts aren't coming up to up your belly. You know, that five-point holds your belts down around your hips. But one of the things it doesn't do in any kind of frontal impacts, nothing's grabbing your hips from sliding forward in the seat. Uh, nobody puts that five point, you know, realistically that five point should go backwards, uh, but there are some jewels in the way, so nobody puts them there. So the six point belt system added to your five point, which makes it a seven point system, is simply amazing. When you lock your hips into a race car, oh my gosh, well, what a difference. I haven't even drive like Kyle Bush. <laughs> hey man, if that's all it takes, that's what I need. <laughs> <laughs> Have you looked at uh, outfitting other cars, like uh, say for instance the Sprint car drivers, not in Sprint Cup, but like the dirt sprints? Yes. Uh, hey, I'm, I'm in, I'm getting very aggravated with those people because I've been on through, you know, 2001 safety change. Well, we lost that learning art. You know, NASCAR put a lot of money and a lot of testing into safety. Uh, it's too bad that, you know, we had to lose four or five other ones before Earnhardt. Mm -hmm. Once they lost, lost Earnhardt, and they were, okay, hold on a minute. We, we don't kind of want to do this anymore. Reassess. You know, safe, safer barriers are wonderful, uh, but there's, there's tracks out there. I mean, it can make their own. You know, I mean, it, it, it's tough to do at certain locations.
organizations. Uh, but then again, from any, a, any kind of wall that moves is better than concrete. The old Armco walls, you know, they, they forgive because they move a little bit. Yeah. Well, that, that, that's okay. You know, as long as it don't come apart and come in there and shoot you. But, you know, a concrete wall that does not move, kind of those things are vicious to hit. Oh, yeah. That's going yeah, to spend a lot of money on safety. Uh, and, and, you know, knock on wood, and that's going to kill anybody. Uh, dirt sprint cars, Jason Leffler last year got killed, Craig Williamson, Josh Burton, and five or six guys in that series that uh, were killed last year. Yeah, I think they're going to have to do something. They're going to have to change something over there to to better protect the driver in that cage or somehow, something. Yeah. I, I don't know what a good answer is, but... Well, it's a system again. You know, you, you, we cannot put a good seat in one of those cars uh, the way they have them mounted. The way they have the mounted seats in those cars are, are like between your shoulder blades, right above your waist. Mm. I mean, when you didn't have a seat and you put all your load on your ribs, okay, that's fine. You know, you, you had a lot of movement, but... You know, you, you really didn't have to worry about it. Well, now, once you make a containment seat, all your pressures are on your shoulders. Well, you, you can't mount it in the middle of your back. You have to mount it higher, wider. You know, I mean, the manufacturers or chassis manufacturers have to get in there and say, okay, guys, I've yet, I only have one guy at the BRI show this uh, last December. I had a sprint car guy come up to me, and, I, and I've been dabbling in the sprint cars. So that Butler guy's been in there for 20 years, and he thinks he's an expert. And I don't tell you, you know, that, that's okay. I don't want to step on anybody's toes. But when people die and I have to go to a funeral, you know what? I'm going to smash some toes now. Right. And you know, one jacket manufacturer finally came up to me and said, Randy, how do we mount your seat? I said, really? I said, this is the first time in 18, 15 years I've been in business. Somebody has asked. I send people seats. I put all the holes in their seats. Sprint car seats, I put the holes in them where, where I test on my seats so I know where I want the seat to be mounted. Well, 85% of them don't mount it correctly because they don't have mounts in the car to work. And I was like, guys, I think they, I said, you cannot hold, you know, you have to mount the seat the way we test our seats to be for our strength. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it, it, it's an ongoing process. Um, I'm, I'm aggravated how slow that that series is want to help, you know, the drivers. Drivers, I mean, you know, they are a bunch of darn noodleheads. Because, golly, I mean, we were, have I driven a race car without a seat? Yes, I did, Oxford Rain. Have I driven a race car without a fire suit? Yes, I did, practiced it many times. Mm -hmm. Why? Because that's what we do. Right. But it's not. But it's not right. You know. Would I let my son do it? Either one of them? No. <laughs> I better not be there. That's for sure. Not no, but hell no. <laughs> yes. I mean, more people have been hurt, you know, testing than than we hear about because you never hear about it when they're testing. Uh, because I mean, when you strap in and you fire that motor up and you head on a racetrack, it can happen at any time. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Randy, got a, uh, another question for you. Uh, Nate, I noticed you were doing something on Indiegogo. You want to tell us something about that? Yeah, it's a crowdfunding site. Uh, Indiegogo is under the Safer Racer Tour. This is a Safer Racer Tour I started seven years ago, going to all these short tracks, talking to people, showing them different products of head and neck restraint, seat belts, systems in these cars. Uh, and it, it it's draining me. It, 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 it's, it's, I'm going broke doing this. I'm very passionate about not letting people get hurt. Uh, and it's a crowdfunding site. If you go to it, you know, we got some perks for you. If, if you want to help, uh, try. Like I said, I'm going up to Wisconsin here next week. Uh, last week I was in Carolina. Two weeks ago I was in Tennessee. Uh, you know, Kentucky. This weekend I'm going Saturday night to Kentucky. So it's something that I'm very passionate about, the Safer Racer Tour, and I've been always thinking about ways to, to help and, and to raise money. I mean, I sent out, I uh, went to the driver's meeting, and I gave every NASCAR driver a envelope and said, here, guys, please help me. You know, I could be at the, where, where was I? I was out in Missouri, Kansas, and in the Clint Boyer was there. He was like, what the hell are you doing out here? I'm trying to help, man. I'm just trying to help. 
how many people uh, put something in that envelope and give it back to you? Uh, Jerry Johnson. Is there a good friend? Johnson's the only one that has ever helped. Uh, and, you know, I mean, I think I know a lot of people. Uh, you know, I'm not a... I'm definitely not a social media person. I'm not I have trouble getting emails or returning. Uh, <laughs> the, the, the social media stuff, it's, it's mainly a social media deal. And, you know, between our seat company, uh, LinkedIn, and all that stuff I've had, you know, I think our seat company, we got whatever, 3,500 people, likes, whatever that is. And my LinkedIn account, I got 1,800 people. Uh, and I check my... I, count before I come home tonight and I had 33 people told me. I was like, wow, that's all I know is 33 people. Holy mackerel, Andy. You know, and I got 20 days left. So I'm just trying to raise some funds so I can, I've averaged 20 to 40 racetracks a year. Okay, well, well, good for you. Yeah, and it's just, it's not getting any easier. I mean, fuel prices are going crazy. Uh, uh, racetracks, or even giving me trouble to let myself in or without paying, you know, the, the 25 bucks to get in the back gate. Really? I don't try to save lives here. You know, I help me out, you know, and uh, but most of the time I can talk myself into it and then get into the racetrack. Uh, and then at the end of the day, hey, guys, it, you know, what you just did to those people, that was awesome. Yeah, I can't imagine that somebody wouldn't let you in. I, I mean, that just, that would just blow my mind. Have you tried going out to Knoxville, Iowa yet? Oh yeah, I've been up to Knoxville, I've been to Boone, Iowa every year, uh, and you know, that, that spring cars, I'm going to get a little heavier in it, because like I said, the, the Bella people have, have lived on the spring car circuit, I don't understand how, you know, they operate their business, I mean, I've had customers there, you know, a handful here, a handful there, and I seen a customer last year in Charlotte, and he didn't have my seat in the car, I'm like, dude, where's my seat? He's like, you know. Jeannie gave me five of them to get to get Rick to take yours out. <laughs> I, I, I said it to Australia. I put it in my Australian card. I love it. I was like, really? So I, uh, you know, people are giving things away to get them out of my product. So I, I you know, it, it's uh, that's the world we live in. I mean, well, it speaks volumes of how good the quality is. The, the sad part is that the people are letting themselves get bought out that way. Well, you're correct. That's right. And the racers, you know, if I was on that side of the fence, uh, it, it would be totally different. But, you know, racers, if it's free, for, it's for me. Uh, mm -hmm. And that's the way they're always going to be. Yeah, but, you're right. It's uh, tough, yeah, it's tough to say, hey, but you're sore, you're black and blue, and you're not as comfortable. But yet, you're, you, it's free. Right, so it better be free because I wouldn't buy it either. <laughs> well, I tell you what, a friend of mine, she races out there at Knoxville, and I think she said something about maybe trying to get one of your seats for her car. She races in the 410. Well, doctor, and, and I'm, I'm working right now. I'm, I'm here to come up with a, uh, I got one. I have a design. Uh, I had it at the PRI show. I'm going to have, I'll come up with a carbon fiber seat. Uh, and this carbon fiber seat is going to be able to go into sprint cars, uh, dirt cars, rally cars. It's going to be a multi-size, custom fitted, uh, belts to the seat. It's going to be a badass thing. I'm doing a lot of testing with it right now. Uh, on my own test break, I got some uh, test days coming up here in about a month. I'm uh, going to Indianapolis because one of the things that the carbon industry has done when they came into the the seat world, is they don't do no, they, they don't do no testing. I, I said, how do you know how strong it is? Oh, it's okay. I said, bro, I said, you know what, I've sled tested a lot, and I know where my aluminum fails, and that's what I need to know about carbon, because that's a different entity, totally. Uh, it's not like once you bend it, your carbon has memory, it goes back. Mm -hmm. if, if there's a crack in there, then all of a sudden you, the next time you do it, you know, you're sitting in toothpicks. And right. I was like, guys, I, I don't know about you. I don't know how people can be in the safety industry and, and not care about anybody. But, you know, at the end of the day, it's just a seat. Well, you know what? It's just a seat that my son could sit in, your son could sit in, your daughter could sit in. And, you know, they trust the manufacturers 
to put a good product out there. So when I do this carbon seat, it's gonna it's gonna be a pretty nice piece. Yeah, well, I've seen a couple of your seats, and they are really nice. Uh, there was a kid that ran with us in arena. He had one. Uh, last year, some kid up in Pennsylvania, but I guess uh, you have like a, a program for kids as they get older to exchange their seat in and, and get a bigger seat. Absolutely, and that's one of the things. It, it's, it's a neat deal. A uh, uh, golfer, Tom Kite, I uh, happened to be playing uh, in a tournament with Tom Kite, and he knew about me, uh, which was cool. I was like, wow, I thought he was old stick in the mud with his thick glasses and stuff, but he was a a really, really nice gentleman, <laughs> and we got to talk, and I think Corey was, I think, 13, 14 at the time, and I said, you know, Tom, I said, one of the issues, I said, it was later in the year, I said, you know, we started the year, you know, Corey was, you know, say, three foot eight. Well, at the end of the year, he was four foot eight. Mm -hmm. Man, I said, and you can't use the same seat. He goes, well, he says, you know, golf companies do it where, you know, same thing. When there's always a three foot eight kid, there's always a four foot kid, four foot two on up the line, and they can't use the same golf clubs. He goes, they outgrow them. I said, absolutely. He goes, well, what they do is you buy in at a young age, and you just trade them out. As you're outgrowing, you send them back. They'll send you another set. He goes, they hope that when you get 16, 17, You'll buy a nice set of clubs from them. And it wasn't two weeks later, I was at a trade show, and uh, the Canadian company, uh, Kirkies, the guy said, Randy, you doing anything with kid seats? I said, ah, not yet. I said, I'm, I'm working on a, a new stamping. I said, because my, my kids are coming up. I said, so I need to do something. He goes, yeah, you got to get into the kid stuff. He goes, I got to buy a new seat every six months. <laughs> and I was like, well, yeah, I got to buy shoes. I got to buy shoes. You know, I gotta buy clothes, I gotta buy fire suits. I was like, that's really not fair to the parent. So what I do now is, is the same thing. You buy it at an early age, when they're 16 years old, most of the time we upgrade the seat three or four times. Every winter, I mean, I, I think I got, I had 40, almost 50 seats sitting out, sitting in the shop, and I think I got about six left. Uh, so every winter we always get seats for the kids, and. What we do, we, we put some padding in them first, and then once all the padding's out, then we got to cut and then we got to weld. Uh, but that, that's something that usually the parents don't have a cost and for two, three years. Shipping costs, and that's it. So I'm just trying to help out, you know, because it's not fair to the parents that, that the kids want to race. And like I said, you got to buy a $1,200 fire suit, you got to buy a helmet, you got to buy clothes, you know, I'm not trying to be nice to them. And, Everybody else tells me I'm a fruitcake to try to help people, but you know, that's just part of my DNA. Yeah, <laughs> well, well, it's kind of a double-edged sword. you got to make a living, too. This is true. Absolutely right. Yeah. So let's shift gears to your driving. And you, you, there was like, what, like three or four years there. You couldn't do any wrong. That's a great year. 96, 97, uh, you know, I was the king of the Bush series before Junior showed up. <laughs> right. <laughs> and uh, I, I had a great time. It, it was awesome. I even, I mean, Junior, Kensif, I run third to them that year. Uh, run fifth the year after that. And it really proved to me a couple different things. You know, I started to lose some focus because the seat company was, was getting bigger and bigger and mm -hmm. I was trying to get it going. Uh, and it really proved to me that, you know, the, the people, when we went through some people, I mean, I, I thought we could win four championships in a row. We did two. I said, nobody's going to touch us. But, it, you know, the, the, the car chief had an issue with his wife. Crew chief had an issue with over here. This, when, when you lose focus, oh my goodness, man, it's simply amazing. So that's, that's one of the things that uh, I learned a lot. Uh, Enjoyed a lot, raced against a lot of great race car drivers, raced against some not good race car drivers. <laughs> and, and, and just had a good time. I mean, uh, the, the Bush Series was, was something that needs to come back because it, it, it's crazy. The Nationwide Series now is just wandering around out there. I, you know, I'm glad to see young guys coming in here and finally doing well. Chase Elliott, hopefully my son gets a chance. Uh, this Larson kid, I mean, but one of these things, it aggravates me to watch these races is, you know, my son Corey has built his own cars, ran K&A, has outrun Kyle Larson, Chase Elliott, 
and Kyle Larson in the Revolution House car from NASCAR. Chase Elliott was in the Hendricks car. And a car that my son built by himself, so he outrun him. And I was like, golly, I said, man, I hope he gets a chance because he's fun to watch. I mean, there's a handful of the Brandon McReynolds, Coleman Presley, I mean, Steve Bristol's kid, uh, Kyle. I mean, there, there's, a, there's a two handfuls of kids out there that is never going to get a chance because there's no car owners anymore. There yeah. used to be car owners that, okay, if you pissed one off, it doesn't matter. You went, you went two trailers down and you brought your seat and you went, went racing for him. Uh, you, you didn't have to bring a pocket full of money, you know, and, and nowadays that's all they want. So, and there's a bunch of kids on the sideline that, that are talented, but they might not ever get a chance. Yeah, that's something that's like changed over the years that you know, before they would bring a rookie in and they would give him time to progress where now if you don't run up front in the first couple of races, you're done. Well, yes and no. I mean, there, there are certain people out there, well, the rookies that come in usually have liked. Right, sure. Yeah, Kyle Larson is riding the diversity program. Mm hmm so, you know, that's good. He's a good kid. He's a damn good racer. I've watched him at the Chili Bowl. Uh, same thing there. He was a customer when he was a kid. Well, he's still a kid. But yeah. he was a spring car kid. I mean, I was at the Chili Bowl, and he goes, Randy, I need some new seats. He goes, oh, I brought them. I said, okay, that's great. I said, send them back to me. And I didn't hear from him. And then I was, the next thing I know, I see a picture of him in the paper, and he's got a bowler uniform on. So I oh, great. So, <laughs> they lost another one, right? Yeah, that's right. I, 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 people do anything for a free fire suit. You get to see it. <laughs> well, I can't say anything. I've, I, you know, something like you said, if it's free, I mean, we're 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 prone to take it. Yeah, exactly right. You know. But I'll say when when you were driving the, uh, I keep wanting to say Nationwide Series, but it was the Bush Series then. And you had some opportunities to go Cup, and and you actually didn't want to do a full time Cup Series. You actually liked staying in the Bush Series. Is that correct? Uh, yes, 98 was uh, the 50th anniversary year. Mm -hmm. And I just won two championships. I had a great relationship with Anheuser Bush, with Chevrolet. Uh, Ricky Craven got hurt. So Rick Hendrick, well, it wasn't Rick, it was John Hendrick, called me. Uh, Rick was in his house arrest days that day. Uh, <laughs> that uh, year. Uh, and they called and said, Randy, we want you to drive the Budweiser car. Hell yeah, you know. Mm -hmm. I drove the thing nine times, and, and we run the top five, I, I think four of them, yeah. and it was great. I, I loved it. That, that Hendricks organization is simply amazing. And at the end of the year, Budweiser, who I had a great relationship with, they Randy, we want you to drive next year. Rick Hendricks, or John Hendricks, or Randy, Randy Doran, and he said, Randy, Budweiser wants you. We'd love to have you back. You did a great job for us. And I was like... Uh, well, you know what? I mean, during the nine races I did for them, uh, I did like 50 appearances, which was great. I had a great time. I mean, how, how do you not have a good time working for Budweiser? Right, right. Uh, it's got free drinks, right? <laughs> the, the, well, just maybe if I wanted them. Uh, <laughs> but sometimes, you know, those things with the short dressers weren't that hard to hang out with either. <laughs> and, and at the time, let's see, my boys were, I think, six and three. Uh, and we, I built the go-kart track, and we started having fun, but once I, I said, okay, let, let me go home and talk to the wife and, and, and see. I said, I, I'm not going to say yes, I'm not going to say no. Uh, so I had to think really hard, you know, okay, I'm a two-time champion, and I, I've exceeded all my expectations for wanting to, to, to go somewhere and racing. Uh, won a North Championship, won two South Championships. I was like, okay, never thought I was going to do that. Uh, well, but then again, when I went to the cup level, that was a totally different world. I mean, after about three or four races on the cup side, life was different. It wasn't the same life I had. I couldn't go. Uh, every time I went somewhere, people bothered you. I mean, I was like, really? Jesus, I, I mean, I'm a two-time champion. They, they, you race NASCAR on Sunday. Yeah, oh, okay, great. <laughs> I, I, I would say I'd respect you for it because I, I could totally understand how it's, it'd be much easier running a nationwide series. It's a little more relaxed compared to the cup schedule. And, and the pressure is not, and not that it's not higher, you don't put enough pressure on yourself, but it's still it's not a, a, a bunch added on to you. 
Oh, it was crazy. And one of the things I always did throughout my career, if I ran in the top five, I gave everybody in the shop 50 bucks. If I won the race, I gave everybody in the shop 100 bucks. Well, when I ran in the top five with that cup card, it, it went from eight people in the shop. <laughs> so, 40 people or something. Yeah, like, wow, holy jeez, that's a lot of $50 bills. <laughs> and, and it was all good because it, if it wasn't for them, I wouldn't have done what I had to do. Mm -hmm, true. One of the things, one of the decisions I made that year, 98, was, you know, it, it, I wanted to be home for my kids. My dad gave me Sundays. He was a racer, too. Uh, and he had to spend time with the kids. And when you have kids, you better take care of them. Uh, lay the foundation. So, and I really liked my wife. Uh, and <laughs> I didn't think at the end, if I would have went cup racing with Budweiser, I don't think I would have been married long because of temptations and, and stuff like that. So I was like, you know what? I'm going to throw away a lot of money. <laughs> 2001, I had an opportunity to go back to Cup Race. I got a guy offered me two million bucks. Like Michael Walter, all was 2000, because Michael left Jim Smith and went to DEI. And Jim Smith said, "Randy, I want you to drive my car. Give me two million bucks, and I'll make you 200 thousand." And I was like, "Okay, that's ten times the money." And I was like, "Okay." So Sunday we come home from racing go karts, swimming jumping on a trampoline, watching the race. I said, I told my boys, that guy, I said, I could drive that car next year. Corey was nine. He was, oh, we can do the motorhome tour. We'll be here to race go-karts. I said, no, I ain't going to be doing none of that. Oh, I'll think about it. Oh, I asked my six-year-old. I said, Casey, what do you think? He goes, why do you want to do it? I said, well, I can make a lot of money. <laughs> yeah. And he says, well, don't you make a lot of money now? And I looked at him. I looked at him. I was like, yeah? He goes, why do you need more? Yeah, it's, it's, give it to a kid to put it in perspective for you, right? You're a winning kid. I thought, okay, <laughs> why do you need more? And so I kind of lived my life like that. And, you know, thankfully my dad has taught me, you know, if you, if you can't buy it, you don't need it. So go. Yeah, well, I, I respect you for that. I, I I was pretty good going over the wall, and, and I started to try to do it for a living, and I had a daughter come along. And I think that time is... Uh, um, King, the 33 car, Robert Presley was driving the cup car, and they had a horrible time at Daytona, and they had a tryout, and I started to go down there. And I think that time you had to be gone 36 weeks out of the year, and I just thought about it, and I said, you know what, I'd just be better off at home. It's amazing. I mean, to be a champion, you have to be selfish. True. And that's something that, uh, you know, I didn't think I was good at, because you had to give it 24-7. And that's why I did it three years in a row, and then the whole team had to give it 24-7. And I could see that it's hard to get in that way. I just couldn't do something for the money. If I was going to do it, I wanted to be the best at it. Right. And, and that's one of the reasons I got out of the car. Can I still go up there and make a couple hundred thousand dollars and start in park cars? Absolutely. But are you kidding me? Really? No, that, that's not me. I'm not going to, you know, if, if I can't go there and walk through that garage with my chest out and have somebody say, hey, how fast is he today? That's the guy we're going to have to beat. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, about 2004, that, that stopped. <laughs> I was like, okay, I'm done. <laughs> All right, so then, all right, let's go to, to Corey. How, what's, what's Corey's plan or what, he, what is he doing this year? Or Super Shoe, we, 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 I guess is his nickname. Yeah, I had a good day. There's him and uh, Stroker. Is his, Stroker is Coleman Presley. Slice Brand is Legato. Franchise the Little McReynolds. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, there's about five of them. They, they all nicknamed each other. And Corey happened to be Super Shoe. Mm -hmm. I told him to, to drop it, especially after he wrecked the Kansas last year. And in our car, I said, you ain't a Super Shoe. So, <laughs> Corey, you know, I've been for, for probably five, six years now. Uh, I've gone to every car owner. I said, hey, give my kid a chance. He, he's a talented kid. He's fast, understands the car, can build it if you want him to. Give him a chance. And nobody would either, nobody would have talked to me. Uh, Rick Hendricks, I had a meeting with Rick, and Rick like, Randy, you know, we're not doing development no more. We're, we're done. That was two years ago. Two weeks later, they hired Chase Elliott. I was like, you lying. Oh, I was mad. I was still mad as a boy. 
Just, just tell me, I'm a big boy, you know? You right, don't like right. You don't want them. Right. I did, I did get to meet Corey before, personally. He was out at Langley back in 2012 for the K&N race. Yes. I actually got a picture on Facebook with him and Kyle Larson sitting side by side. Hey, Corey won that race, yeah. Yeah. Yep. He won five of them that year, and, and really... You know, I just found out, I think, the fall of last year when we had that carburetor penalty uh, that cost us the championship. We only run five races, and we had a carburetor issue, and I didn't know nothing about it. I don't know nothing about carburetors. Robert Yates did the motors, and it was wrong. Okay, it's wrong. Case closed next. Well, they penalize us points, uh, and we, he lost the chain. He took 25 points from us, and he lost the championship by six. Uh, well, the end of last year, the engine shop, or the engine shop called me and said, Randy, we got an issue. So what's that? Because out of the Holly carburetor box is a part the same as your son's. Are you kidding me? Uh, I, I happened to call Mike Helton, brought it to the R&D center. Mike Helton was there, looked at it, looked at it. And, and Mike's like, well, it's not going to change nothing. I was like, Mike... I said, well, what do you mean it's not going to change nothing? Because, you know, we can't change nothing. Because your kids are going to be around for a while. And they're going to win another one. <laughs> really? I, 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 it's just, oh, golly. I mean, it's, uh, it's aggravating. But now, I mean, he, he, he finally got signed. Uh, Richard Petty Motorsports called him up last June, I think. Uh, and he said, okay, we want to hire you guys to do it on the gun. Oh, man, I don't want to the kids on right. Go ahead. And... I looked at his contract, they're paying him. I was like, wow, they're paying him more money than I made my first year when I won the championship. <laughs> I was like, even better. And then last year, I was right, I, we had an offer car, and Corey raced it. He did it all himself. Uh, won three out of the five that we went to. And they said, okay, we're going to run him in, in six nationwide races. Okay, well, at the end of the year showed up, and you know, they, they brought him down to Homestead, and run a car, and I was like, okay, that, that wasn't that good. Uh, supposed to be run, uh, you know, right now he gets a paycheck to sit on the sideline because they don't have the money it costs to go nationwide race. It's simply astronomical what it costs to, to run a nationwide car, and I don't know why. I was asked, you know, last car, and then I said, listen, guys, I was like, a race car is easy to build. People can round up. Ten, fifteen thousand dollars to go racing on a weekend. I was like, you know, I said I was rounding up five to ten for K and N racing and Arca racing. I said, you know, we can do that. We can call the racetracks and get local people, get three local companies to put in five grand, and, and you got your weekend paid for it. And you do well. Well, the Nationwide Series is, is, is just crazy right now when you have to lease a motor for thirty-five thousand dollars per event. And I was like, you know, it's a million dollars a year. To lease an engine. Yep. Right. You don't own nothing. And, and I said, guys, I said, you know, yeah, but those are the cup engine builders that are doing this. And that cup engine is, is a work of art. 900 horsepower, it's a work of art. And now that they take that 900 horsepower motor, they dumb it down to a 650 horsepower motor for, their, for the nationwide in the trucks, but they, they lease it to you for $35,000 per event. I would have thought it'd been more than that because I think the cup motors are like a hundred. Yes. Yep. Hundred and twenty, I think. I think that's what. Uh... That that's fantasy land. Sunday Sunday racing, you know, with the TV money they have and the first money, that's totally separate than a nationwide or a truck. You, and and they can't think. You have to think totally different. And like I told Mike Elton, I said, Mike, I was like, you, I said, there's no owners around no more. Why? Because who has a million dollars to spend on an engine? For 650 horsepower, there's production engines. You know, you can spend a hundred grand on, on four production engines and run the whole year. I was like, you just had ten more owners come in because the cars, you know, at the end of the day, it's, it's tubing. You know, I mean, people build their own cars, right? But they can't build their own money. You can build one of these new motors, not to compete with those cup guys. Right. You know, those cup guys need to stay on Sunday, and that's kind of what happened to the truck series and nationwide series, I think, because. You know, they, they, they have a lot of money, and, it, and and the regular broke guys don't have. You know, we always seen in a Bush series always had local guys come in. I mean, if you had five, ten local guys go to every racetrack that was nearby because hey, we can do this. Let's go. Yeah. 
Right, yeah. A couple yeah. guys would get together, put a car together, an old car, yeah. and, and try it, yeah. And then no more, because of, because of the engine. I mean, the engines are, are, are crazy, and it's, it's crazy because it's 650 horsepower. What, what would they do if they... Three different ways. What what would happen if somebody said, okay, let's let's kill all this engine crap and just everybody go to a crate motor? If something has to happen, you know. I mean, on the cup side, uh, leave it leave it wide open. Uh, I think that leaving the cup side because there is so much money there. You know, those TV packages they just signed, huge money. That's Sunday. That's good. There's nothing there on Friday and Saturday though. They, yeah, I mean, if you want a 650 horsepower engine. Okay, if, if, like I said, production motors, right? That's a, a crane engine. I mean, that, there's enough of them out there. I mean, you could go each manufacturer, Dodge, Toyota, Chevrolet, Ford, they, they all have, I'm sure they have production motors. Yeah. That's okay. I mean, we don't have to run these things 8,000 RPM. We have one Formula One. You know, I mean, we're 650 horsepower. Run the thing at, at 6,000 RPM. The thing will last you half the season. You rebuild it and you keep going. Uh, and that's just, somehow they gotta curtail the cost of the engine. Yeah, I mean, I remember back when I was running late model, I mean, hell, I got a whole freaking car ready to roll for five grand. Absolutely, uh, and you, you would not believe, I mean, if there's nationwide cars, because they're all, it, the cup teams, and that's another thing what they're doing. Yeah. I think uh, Turner Scott, uh, that Turner Scott Nationwide shop last week, they told me they built 56 race cars last year. And I don't know what RCR does, what Hendricks does, what, I mean, Gibbs and these guys, it, it is, they just build cars just to build them. Everyone they build, they try to get it to pick lighter. And I was like, well, where is, where is all these other cars? They're like, oh, we just scrap them. Yeah, I think, the, I think the average life of a cup car is like three races, if I'm not mistaken. <laughs> really? Yeah. I, th I think that's what I've heard somebody say. I, I raced on Ellie May. I mean, she was there when I got there in 95, and she was still there when I left in 99. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's like when you got a good one, you kept it, because for whatever reason, it was just good. It always ran well, you know? Yeah, absolutely right. Oh, goodness. So this one, man, we got to get these expenses down for these Friday, Saturday guys. Uh, really? So they can compete uh, with with the cup guys. You know, I, I think the Bush Series, Nationwide Series changed. What I've seen it change is, is when Dale Jr. come in, because uh, Dale Sr. had something. And, you know, if I had what Mr. Childress had, Mr. Hendrick had, I would give my son everything I got to, to help him. Sure. Right? And, you know, so when Senior did that to Junior, it upped the level of the Bush Series. It went from a, you know, a, a million dollar series to a two million dollar series. Because Bernhardt, okay, well, we need some, well, we need some engineers, now. okay, hire him. Well, we need somebody to hire him. Because he had it. He could give his kid whatever he wanted. Well, then you've seen after his, let's see, Junior had two. I think the last Bush Series champion was uh, Jeff Green at PPC. Uh, and then after that, uh, Mark Truex and, and BEI. Uh, then you've seen Gibbs. Then you've seen RCR. Now you see Penske. You know, they win all the races. I, I looked and Chase Elliott, I mean, which at the Hendricks program, Junior Motorsports, all, all Hendricks, is the nine car is seventh place in points in the owner's points. He's leaving the driver's points because nobody else in front of him can get points. Right. He's, he's seventh in points. That means there's six cup guys in front of him every darn week. And I don't know, that, that just makes it hard for me to swallow coming from that series, you know. Mm-hmm. I just, I just think they should go back to you race your own series and that's it. Well, uh, I've never seen a, a professional golfer go back to anything else. I've never seen an NBA guy go to, go to your Final Four. You know, I've never seen a Super Bowl guy go to a national championship game for and play. You know, I mean, uh, obviously there's some right to work stuff. Uh, now, when you were running the Bush Series, I mean, there were some cup guys, but it was nowhere nearly as many, right? Well, there, there were no cup teams. And that, that's where, you know, I, I love racing cup guys. 
I love the club. And it, it made me a better driver because they're good. I didn't right. say they're real good. Uh, if they were in the same equipment. But now their equipment is so much better. True, yeah. right. And, yeah. and that's where, you know, the, and if you don't have a nickel, you don't have diversity, there's nobody in the nationwide series. And I, I don't believe the promoters, I, the race fans want to see a good race. Race fans want to see a little bit of drama. Well, if you put a bunch of these 18 to 25 year old kids out there, <laughs> damn good race car drivers and, and got maybe some of them even having personality. Right. It, it, it'll be fun to watch. But I mean, I, you watch Kyle Bush, he runs second the last two weeks, and it looks like he just shot, shot his dog when he gets out of your car. <laughs> oh, are you kidding me? The, he got beat by a, a, a nationwide regular. Yeah, exactly. And I was like, wow, you know, I mean. I mean, that's at the point where, I mean, I'd rather see a nationwide regular win than a cup driver. Uh, absolutely, yeah. Oh, I mean, that's great. I mean, I would too. I mean, uh, but, but like I said, you know, I mean, the, the equipment they're in, like Chase Elliott, that, that, uh, it's a, I know a guy that works at Junior Motorsports, worked there for six years now. Uh, well, more than that, it's by damn near 10 years. So Lars Junior Motorsports has been in, he's worked there. He came over from Hendricks, he worked on the, the Budweiser car when I was there, and, and I just happened to see him last week. You know, we're talking, I say, great job with Chase, you know, he, he laughed, he goes, yeah, it's great. He says, he goes, Randy, I've been to juniors, he says, since we started, and everything came from Hendricks. Every motor, you know, cars, everything comes from Hendricks. He goes, this year, he goes, you, normally we get three engines every week, they put them in the cars. This year, Chase Elliott has his name on his action. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm sure he's got the best of the best, for sure. Uh, and you know what? That, that's great, because uh, obviously he's going to be Jeff Gordon in replacement, and they're, they're trying to get him as quick as he could. And, you know, Chase, Chase has run, you know, 50 to 100 races a year for six or seven years now. Mm -hmm. Filling eyes like the Dillon Boys, like Legato, I mean, uh, like Kyle Larson, that's why I'm trying to get the Petty Group to help Corey. He, 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 he's very talented, and that's one thing I told him growing up. I said, Corey, you have to make every lap count. I said, you're not, we're not financially set enough to, to race you 50 times a year. We might only race 5 to 10. I was like, but those laps you make, you have to make them good. You have to learn something. I said, because you're not going to have the privilege of racing a lot, uh, like these other kids had. You know, I mean, they're, they're, they're those, some of these guys, I mean, Joey Legato lived at Atlanta Speedway for two years, and it was in a cup car running around Atlanta at 14 years old. You know, the Dillon boys, I mean, they wore up Kentucky Speedway by themselves. The, 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 the asphalt on it. So, I mean, is it, but that's the game that we play now. Yeah. Now, is... Is he going to be able? Is Corey going to be able to run any of the K and N stuff at all, or is he just going to be stuck sitting side? As a matter of fact, he, he's kind of crew chiefing uh, a guy. I, I sold all my all our K and N stuff that Corey built. Uh, sold it to Austin Hill uh, out of Georgia. He won Dover last year, uh, two times in a row. After Corey started, he built and, he, and we sold it, and we we kind of babysit him out of our shop. He hired the, the Corey's helper. Uh, Corey's going down to Gresham with them tomorrow to, to test. Uh, I'm, I'm out of here. The jury racing's defunct, as I know it. I'm done. And, <laughs> uh, you've gone as far as you're going, huh? Yeah, I'm done. I can't, I can't take him any farther. That's why I was really happy when Teddy, Teddy signed him. I was like, this is great. Uh, but uh, I wish that you know they, they have some investors in there. Uh, and Rich Petty Motorsports, and they kind of call a shot. And they want Corey. I mean, rumor has it Marcus Ambrose is leaving to go back to Australia, and you know they want Corey to fill that seat. Well, I was like, guys, I was like, give the guy a shot. I was like, that's like having a designated hitter, uh, not even take batting practice. Yeah. I was like, yeah. I said, look, look at how. The development drivers are doing. I said, look at Chase Elliott, Kyle Larson, you know, the, the, the Dylan boys. I mean, these, these kids are, are running well. I said, but because somebody has invested in them. 
And if they, if they have invested, Rickers, he's getting paid. But the, the cost of racing, and obviously, if they don't have recovery, they're not going to do it. I think we had Austin on here not too long ago, did we? Austin. Austin Hill. Oh. Mm. Austin Hill? Okay, maybe. I don't know. Not that I remember. Oh, well. Uh, we, we, we've been doing this, I've been doing this show since uh, early 2000s, so, I mean, <laughs> we've had some people through here. Oh, yes, you have. That's awesome. But, anywho. Well, Randy, let us go ahead and let you get going. I'm sure uh, you're probably getting hungry by now. <laughs> but we ran you way past our 15-minute allotment. <laughs> and, uh, it's all good. Well, I love talking to you guys. love talking safety. love talking racing. love talking about the kids. Uh, you know, but right now, I said that, that safer racer is on Indiegogo. And if people feel like they want to help, you know, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do it until my wife tells me I can't afford it. <laughs> Until she takes the checkbook away from you, huh? Oh, well, she took my card away just yesterday. <laughs> Uh-oh. <laughs> well, hey, Randy, we'll have to get you back on here again sometime in the near future. Really enjoyed it. Um, that's why I put you at the very end, because I knew we weren't going to spend just 15 minutes. Mm -hmm. That's awesome, guys. Thank you. No, thank you, Randy. It was, it was a pleasure talking to you. Okay, man. Be good, guys. All right. Talk to you later. That was good. I enjoyed that. I mean, yeah. You know, he's got a broad range of, of, of knowledge. He's been in the sport a long time, so that, that was really fun. I was texting back to Corey. He says, oh, we're talking about you, boy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. Yeah, he, he's, I've, I've met Randy before, uh, checked out some of his seats. Terry had said something about she might be getting one. That's why I was wondering if he was going to be going up toward Knoxville, because she headed back. She went back to Mississippi, and at uh, the beginning of the month, she's going to head up to Knoxville, start getting the sprint car all ironed out, ready to. So she's got a ride for that? Oh, she's, I think we're going to have like the, the, what, 360, 410 and the 460 or 305, I forget what it is. They have the three different sprint cars, and I think they have all three. She's going to supposed to drive all three of them. Yeah, that's Martinsville Mud. <laughs> when I was up there and opened the door at the strange angle of the hill, and the suckers were straight into the mud. <laughs> So keep a keepsake there. Anybody want some Martinsville blood? Mm -hmm. So anywho, do um, you follow much with Michael Schumacher? No, I heard he's getting better though. Yep. So he's uh, showing some improvements. Yep, they were talking about that uh, today, that uh, after that skiing accident. I mean, I've skied a ton in my years. And the uh, worst I did was fall flat on my face because some kid decided to shoot in front of me from <laughs> out in the trees. I almost ran into him. His mother calls him, are you okay? It'd be a whole lot better if you keep your damn son off the <laughs> ski slopes. But anywho. But uh, yeah, uh, it's nice to see he's he's getting to where he's gaining, getting back to consciousness. But he does drift in and out. Hopefully, prayers out to him. Things get kicking a lot better. Yeah, most definitely. As I mean, that man's used to going fast. Yeah. And now he's... I mean, obviously the man, you know, he's Michael Schumacher. I mean, what, yeah. what did you say? It's Michael Schumacher. Somebody sitting here talking about Jeff Gordon may actually race 10 more years. Well, he said he could race 10 more years. He just made that statement on... Um, Larry King Live. Larry King Live. But he's, they showed a picture of his daughter's got a sprint, or a little sprint car. Yeah. And... Uh, see how she does. I, I just can't see her driving. That's just something. <laughs> He's got a few more years before the boy will start driving, but uh, it'll be interesting. You know, I'm sure she's, I've seen they had Hendrick Motorsports on it somewhere or something. Go so, <laughs> figure. Right. Oh. But uh, hey, good for him. And, you know, it's a nice family bond. See how she does. Oh. I don't know where she's going to be racing, but. Yeah, so it's going to be all good. Mm -hmm. uh, Langley has raced uh, this past weekend. The Southern Modified was interesting. Yeah, I thought, uh, uh, who did we have on? Andy? Andy Seuss. I thought he was going to pull it off there. Are you there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, oh that's right. Duh. You're in the, oh, did you hurt? Well, he got actually told that he jumped the start. And on there that was a, one? Yeah, you know, they on lap 140 with 10 laps to go. Yeah, and yeah, He got yeah, out yeah. there and got ahead. Uh, they told him to move back. 
said he jumped the start. I talked to some people that watched the in the stands, and they said no, the guy that he beat on the start actually spun tires. Uh, you I know, know you got a big jump there. I, I, it wasn't a big happened. jump. It was just the other guy spun tires. He took off, spun tires, and he went as soon as the other guy went. And oh, uh, when I caught up with him right at the finish line at the finish the race, he was not a happy camper. Now, we are going to have him back one next Wednesday. We're going to also have, um, I've got the list somewhere. We're going to have all, we're going to have a driver that qualified on the pole. Him and the driver that qualified third or fourth, um, Ryan Priest. No, Ryan was the one who was on pole. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I believe. Yeah, he's uh, Brian Morehouse. When we were at the track, he says when they were doing their qualifying, he said, "Watch the 41." And sure shit, up there on the pole, and I mean by a good two tenths. Because there. Yeah, it was it was a good race. Uh, yeah. I, I watched it from the other side. The, of the, the there. first half of the race was pretty much everybody was almost the same. I think they were just riding. I think they were saving their time. Well, you know, Langley Lane's rough on tires, so I think they were just riding for that halfway break. Yeah. And then then the tenth of kind of picked break, up. Well, it just went all of a sudden. Shoot, four cars were gone, and everybody else was just left back. Yeah, because I think Andy sat there and rode and rode and rode second, and then I, I can't remember if he passed him before the halfway break and took the lead or not. I thought he did, but I can't remember. Danny mm -hmm. Bone is the other one. B O H N E. Mm -hmm. well, yeah, we had a decent night in the in the wing champs. Of course, they don't have they, didn't have, they don't have me listed at all. <laughs> it showed up late. So they said they were going to fix it. We ended up running eighth uh, in the end. So You weren't even in the My Lap State? Or no, you don't have the transpot. Mm -hmm. You do have them? Yeah. Huh. But, uh, so yeah, I don't know. They'll figure it out. I ain't worry about it. Well, let's wrap this show up. I would have had a good time with Randy. Huh? I would have had a good yeah. time with Randy. Yeah, yeah. But it is what it is. Well, I guess it was just you and me, because our buddy Jack is hobnobbing down yeah. in Charlotte. What's he doing down in Charlotte anyway? Did uh, he, he told me he was in the he was at Junior Motorsports talking to one of the engineers on the five. That's all. I know. He don't let me know anything. I tell you, what can we say? I feel like your red-haired stepchild around. No, no, no. Oh, we forgot. I don't know. I hear. What the heck? Why not? No, we're two hours. Well, we would like to thank everybody for joining us tonight and look forward to having y'all watch next week's show. The show before Richmond. So it'll have to be nice and fun. Yeah, sure. Absolutely. Especially since it's going to be all mostly modified, guys. <laughs> right. But anywho. Hey, guys, I'm Daytona 500 winner Trevor Bain, and thank you for watching Let's Talk Races. Hi, I'm Robert Richardson Jr., driver of the number 23 Dodge Challenger for R3 Motorsports in the NASCAR Nationwide Series, and you're watching Let's Talk Racing. I'm Timothy Peters, driver of the number 17 Toyota in the NASCAR Camp World Truck Series, and you're listening to Let's Talk Racing. <laughs> driver of the 33 NASCAR late model 2011 Old Dominion Speedway track champion thank you for watching Let's Talk Racing TV Hi, I'm Sam Hunt driving a 42 car on a thing Let's Talk Racing Hi my name is Natalie Sather I drive the 94 K&N Lady Eagle Safety Wear Butler Built Seats Bell Helmets Hooker Harness Seat Belts Number 94 at South Boston Speedway Be sure to listen to Let's Talk Racing TV